Linearization is something that may not be an official thing you have to learn um, in the physics SL course, but it's something that comes up so often and it's a skill you're expected to have. I find it's really worthwhile to cover it now. It's especially uh, common on paper two, question A1, the very first question on paper two, very often will have some weird situation you've never heard of. They'll give you a graph and you're expected to do some things with that graph. Uh, for example, yeah, say what you could graph against what to get a straight line and what the slope would be. And this is precisely what we're going to do here. So first of all, when lin linearization, that just means make something linear, make something like a line. So when we talk about linearization, we're just looking at this equation, y equals mx plus, some people say b, some people say c, it doesn't matter. The key thing is this. In this sort of situation, you've got some sort of graph, right? You've got an x here, you've got a y here. So the y and x have to actually be there. But then whatever this m is, that's the slope or the gradient, depending on where you come from. I know in the US we were taught that it's called the slope, but I know uh, in England, for example, uh, they sometimes call it gradient. It doesn't matter. Uh, as far as this b goes, or some people write it as a c, doesn't matter. Um, there we're looking at a graph. I better actually make this one here a little bit lower just so that you can see it. I realize it may be off the screen. So I'll make it uh, like this here. So if I've got this sort of graph here, um, then I could actually think about um, this is x, this is y, and then I would have some sort of uh, graph. Let's say it's like this, some sort of straight line. So this straight line here, that slope would be m, right? That would be the gradient here, the rise over run. And the b value here, that would be the y-intercept. In other words, if you make x equals 0, right, that means this whole thing cancels out. That means y equals that value. So that means when x is 0, this means that's the y-intercept. So that's b just to remind you at least how we work with these graphs. Now I could give an example. So the example could be something like, uh, yeah, y equals 2x minus 1. This is a really simple, maybe really stupid example, but um, I think it bears doing quickly. So if we want to actually graph this, uh, we could actually do it. We know that the slope is 2 and we know that the y-intercept is negative 1. So because of that, what I can do then is, well, assuming this is 1, 2, and 3 here, and this is 1 and 2, and this is negative 1, this is negative 2, and so on, then I could say, well, at negative 1, I have a y-intercept, so there it is. And the meaning of slope means that for every one unit I go to the right, I go up or down by whatever value that slope is, which means from here, I go one to the right, and then I go up two, because the slope is positive two. So I go one right, up two. I can go one right, up two. And if I was good at drawing straight lines, which I'm not, I could draw a straight line through these. Ah, it's a bit curvy. That's what it would look like. Super stupid example, yes. But uh, now I'll give you something a bit more practical. So what if, maybe I'll divide the board a little bit here. So what if this time we're given a situation where now we're actually doing uh, an experiment with springs. So this could be something like we're maybe trying to look at this relation. This is called Hooke's Law, which uh, relates the force on a spring to its displacement x. And k is just a spring constant. Now this negative, it's there to denote that the direction of the force is opposite to the displacement, which means if I stretch it this way, the force, it wants to go that way. So the negative isn't going to be so important. Okay, I'm going to actually ignore the negative. But if you actually did an experiment of this, so you actually sat down and you had a bunch of different uh, maybe weights that you put at the end of a spring. Okay, so you had some sort of springs so like this, there's a little spring, and you've got a little weight at the end of it. And if you knew what its mass was, and then you knew how much it was displaced, this would be x here. And then if you put more weight on it, it would displace more. If you did that experiment, 
then you might have data points that look like this. You know, you'd have things, you'd have values here. I don't need to be that precise because I'm just trying to show the idea. So if you graphed, you know, your different data points, so there's an F versus X here, there's another F versus X data point. You could think, well, what do I have to graph against what to get the value of K? This is a very common type of thing you want to do. Right? You want to find out what's the spring constant. You could actually say, fine, I'll just find the spring constant for this F and X pair and I'll get a K value and then I'll do it here and I'll get it here. I have a bunch of different K's and maybe take the average. But a much better way to do it is to do a graph. It's the whole reason we graph this in the first place. So in this sense, if I graph stuff against stuff, maybe I can be clever and graph the right things in order to get something meaningful. And in this sense, this is why we're going to linearize this, which means I'm going to see this as a straight line. I'm going to see it as a y equals something times x. So take a look then, if I graphed, if I did a graph then of x and f, this will be in newtons and this will be in meters. If I graphed f versus x directly, that means f is like my y, my x is, well, my x, that's nice, and that means my k is the slope. And because I don't have a plus b, I don't have a plus anything here. So this means the y-intercept in this case would be zero. So that means I expect it to cross through the point zero, zero, or the origin. And I would expect it to have some sort of slope. Now whatever that slope is, that slope will be k. Isn't that cool? So if you can graph f versus x, then the slope will be k. That's easy because you, know, you have a bunch of data points and then you draw a line of best fit through them. Then you can actually say, well, that slope of that line of best fit, that's k. You can even go further and say, what's the uncertainty on that slope right? by looking at how much it can go up or down. And that gives you an uncertainty on k. So you could even say k equals blah, 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 plus or minus something. So that's really useful. But what if we have an even more complicated looking example? What if we have something like, um, this time a pendulum. Now the equation uh, for a pendulum, if I remember it right, it's t equals 2 pi times the square root L over g. So this could be another example here. Um, this, what I mean here is we've got some sort of thing here that's actually oscillating back and forth. It could be anything. Okay, so this right here could be an experiment where, um, well, we would have a different value of length. We'll put that in meters. And we would have the period. That's what t means. t is the period, which is in seconds. It just means how long it takes to go back and forth once. Uh, this example, this could actually be, um, I mean, you could be doing anything, right? You could, you could have different lengths of pendulums. This could be a bunch of cats. And if you have a bunch of cats of different lengths and you let them oscillate back and forth, hopefully you're not hurting them, um, then you could actually do this experiment. So a bunch of different cats of different lengths and you measure the period of oscillation for them. That means if you graphed just, um, let's say, T versus L here, you'd actually have a graph that looks like this. And the problem is then, how do I find the slope of that? What does it mean? This is not very useful. It's doable. You could totally graph this. But the problem is, this is a curvy thing. See, I don't want to graph this. By the way, the reason I know that, because g is a constant, 2 and pi are constants. So this t varies as square root of l. So this is a graph of t versus l, and a square root graph does this. Just that's how I knew that shape. But what I can do is linearize this one. I could try to take away that square root. So by doing that, I could actually take a look, and maybe I square both sides. That means I get t squared equals 4 pi squared. Don't forget, you have to do 2 squared pi squared times L. And I can just write the over G here. Take a look now what I've just done. Now, this may still look uh, really weird. And you might think, why in the world did I do this? That's because this, now by itself, that can be my Y. This can be my X. And this junk here, okay, so this junk right here, all this right here, that's going to be my slope. So that means if I graphed, instead of t versus l, which is not very helpful, what if instead I graphed t squared versus l, 
then I've just linearized this. You see that now I've just figured out what I have to graph to get a straight line. And if I do that, I expect, by the way, there's no plus something or minus something on this equation, so I expect it to pass through 0, 0, and that means it's going to have some sort of slope. And the slope now is not going to be exactly equal to g, because by the way, you can do this experiment to find what the acceleration due to gravity is. If you've done your experiment sufficiently uh, accurate, so maybe you really tried to uh, minimize your uh, systematic and random errors, um, if you do it right, you should get a g value of roughly what the acceleration due to gravity should be, which should be 9.81. Now the slope will not be equal to g, right? The slope will be 4 pi squared over g. But if you wanted to find g, then you totally could do it, right? Because g, if I did this, I could just get g on its own and just basically switch it with the slope. So g comes up here, slope goes down. That means g would be equal to 4 pi squared divided by the slope. And that's useful. You see that just from that, from my graph, then, by graphing t squared versus l instead of just t versus l, I can actually get something that's useful. I can take that slope, and that slope can get me g, because g is related to the slope. So hopefully you see how useful this skill can be, of this linearization. This helps not only in uh, physics, but also helps in math. It doesn't just help on paper 2, uh, question A1, although it commonly comes up here. Right? They often ask, what could you graph against what? Or what would the slope mean? Or sometimes they say, what would you graph to get g? And you would just explain exactly this, and you'd be fine. But it also comes up on other uh, exam questions, and I think it's just a useful thing, and a useful uh, way to mix uh, linear graphs with physics.